Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's just noon now. We will be uh, getting started with our community conversation very shortly. We're just gonna give it another minute or two to see if anybody else, uh, <clears throat> and then we'll get started. Hello, everyone. We're just waiting another minute or two to see if anybody else joins us, and then we will start today's conversation. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jeff Feldman. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications at NASW New Jersey. And today we are bringing you a community conversation on the Reproductive Freedom Act, uh, which is a piece of legislation pending in the New Jersey legislature. Uh, and today we are uh, thrilled to be joined by uh, Nicole Tatunjan, MSW who is a member of the Thrive New Jersey Coalition. That is the coalition that is looking to uh, usher this uh, legislation into law. Uh, they're one of the prime movers behind it. And uh, Nicole is also uh, a co-founder of Stanton Strong. Uh, so uh, before I turn over things to Nicole, just a quick reminder that uh, when you signed up for today's conversation, you did uh, sign a code of conduct I was like, my daughter is you not. You will conduct yourself professionally uh, during the mm. webinar and that you will I'm, I'm not place the program. comments um, or like, no, anything not. else uh, in the All chat that, boxes. Uh, is these little uh, sorry for the background noise. Uh, if you are not on mute, please make sure you're muted. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm very happy to turn the conversation over to uh, Noelle. Noelle? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, great. I'm so happy to see so many faces. Um, just to clarify, um, I use the pronoun she, her. I am a social worker. I have my master's in social work, and I define myself really as a political social worker. So, okay, great. Jeff is helping me share my slides because I'm not um, super tech savvy and uh, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> um, so I want to just clarify. So Stanton, I started um, a nonprofit, an advocacy nonprofit organization called Stanton Strong. And Stanton Strong is part of the Thrive Coalition. So um, this presentation that I am uh, going to share with you um, is was created not only by myself, but it was with the help of the Thrive New Jersey Coalition. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the coalition um, in a minute. So you see the, is, it's sharing to me, Jeff, is it sharing to you? Yeah, now I had to open the chat box so I could monitor the chat. Can you see that on the screen as well when you see the slides? I don't, the chat, no, let me see. No, you just see the slides? Yeah. Okay, good, then we are good to go. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, great. Sorry, everybody, just some technical. Um, uh, so I'm gonna give a little background on um, the Reproductive Freedom Act, why, why now, what it is, what led us to doing it. Um, but basically the Reproductive Freedom Act really embodies three major points. Um, it's about rights, it's about equity, 
and it's about access and it's about reproductive health care. Um, and this is actually becoming more and more important that if, if all people are to be equal, abortion has to be actually accessible and not just legal. The access piece of these three pillars is very, very important. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, next slide, Jeff. So the Thrive New Jersey Coalition is a statewide coalition of, um, I think it's actually now over 70 organizations. Um, and we've come together to promote sexual and reproductive health rights and justice um, through policy and advocacy. Thrive New Jersey, if you see at the bottom there, you see thrive-nj.org, that's our website. Um, so feel free, please go to it. It's a great resource. Um, all right, next slide, Jeff. Okay, so RFA stands for the Reproductive Freedom Act. And why did the Thrive Coalition come up with this legislation and why now? Next slide. Rights without access are meaningless. So in New Jersey, we do have the constitutional right to abortion, to illegal abortion, but barriers to ab abortion care, including insurance coverage, stigma, and um, targeted violence has made it less accessible. Next slide. Oh, hang on, it's not advancing for some reason. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, okay, so abortion is a common medical procedure. It's actually very, very, very safe. Um, the reality of abortion is that one in four women in the United States will have an abortion by the age of 45. And six in 10 women who have abortions are mothers. Um, although it is very common, every person's experience is unique. Um, however, there are still patterns that emerge. Um, and I just wanna share an example of one, um, of a patient experience that is somewhat common. I'm gonna call her Rena, just for confidentiality. So Rena um, lives in Southern New Jersey um, and she uses a hormonal birth control method to prevent pregnancy, which causes her to have irregular periods. As a result, um, when Rena discovered that she was having, experiencing an unplanned pregnancy, she was almost 16 weeks pregnant. Now she has a pre-existing condition. That means um, continuing a pregnancy puts her at high risk for health complications. So basically she decided to seek an abortion. Um, her private insurance covers, she has insurance and her private insurance covers the cost of an abortion. So not everybody has insurance and not everybody's insurance providers actually cover it, but in her case they do. Um, however, her plan has a $2,500 deductible. The cost of her care in an outpatient setting would be about $1,000. So to do with the abortion care. So she would be fully responsible for paying for the full abortion, her deductible, she has not met it. And she has to have funds for childcare for her two children and transportation to and from the closest cl clinic to her. I believe she's in, um, uh, well, certain counties have better access than others, but anyway. So the other part of this is that the cost of an abortion and abortion care increases as the gestation increases. So what often happens to Rena and others is that they, they are left in a position of chasing the fee. So the longer it takes for them to be able to get the money, make the, you know, uh, borrow it, um, and also deal with the logistics of transportation or finding, uh, taking off from work if possibly, there are a lot of logistical and financial barriers and, and that create unnecessary delays. 
And these delays then make it more expensive. So it's kind of a, a troubling pattern, um, but, but fairly common. Um, okay, Jeff, the next slide. Great. So I just mentioned here some of the barriers. So abortion patients are disproportionately poor and low income. Uh, not everybody but disproportionately. Um, so insurance coverage is one of the barriers, um, higher costs due to delays, which I just mentioned. Um, some people have no insurance um, or have no path. So if you're an undocumented person, you have no path to insurance. Um, obviously childcare and transportation become an issue with abortion care. And um, we also have basically what we've learned even more so during COVID, the systemic barriers um, to high quality, uh, systemic racism primarily, to high quality um, affordable health care and contraception. And then there is always cultural and linguistic barriers as well. Um, next slide. Wait, did you skip one or no? Uh, I don't think so. Is there one before this? Oh, you know what? That's okay. I'll just talk about it for a second. No, it's okay. We're okay. All right. Go back. Okay. No, it's okay. It's all good. There, these are kind of background ones. Um, so there are, everyone has heard about the problems that's happening across the country, but specifically with Roe versus Wade in our Supreme Court. So there are currently 20 cases pending in the federal courts that could end up in the Supreme Court. And each of those cases are basically challenging an aspect or completely, completely gutting Roe versus Wade. So on December 1st, I think if you recall, you may remember, um, on December 1st, the Supreme Court is actually scheduled this December 1st to hear oral arguments on Mississippi's unconstitutional 15-week abortion ban. Um, we now have, as you know, a very conservative anti-abortion majority and everyone's waiting to see what's gonna happen, but there's a lot of concern. Next slide. So in New Jersey, I mentioned before, we have the legal right to abortion. Okay, so these are um, two of the court cases that have protected our rights. So um, basically New Jersey case law eliminated parental notification and allowed for Medicaid to pay for abortion care under certain circumstances. Um, so in our state constitution, we have the right based on this case law, um, but case law doesn't ensure access. I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm on, I'm on, sorry, <laughs> I'm home. Uh, so, so by law, New Jersey is protected. We are protected as New Jerseyans with case law. We do not, however, have statutory protections and statutory protections are having a statute, meaning a law in the, like a legislation, a piece of legislation that passes is on our books. Um, and uh, um, ensures the right to abortion. We currently don't have that. All right, next slide. So the Reproductive Freedom Act, it's, we call it the RFA <laughs> for short, um, was introduced in New Jersey in uh, a, just a little over a year ago, the beginning of October of 2020, um, Thrive New Jersey Coalition spent about two years um, working on this bill. Literally, it is one of the most comprehensive reproductive rights and reproductive um, healthcare access bill in in the country, if it passes. We have not passed it, we have just introduced it. <laughs> We're gonna get to that. Um, let me tell you the main, the main pillars of the Reproductive Freedom Act. 
The next next slide, Jeff, please. Thank you. Whoops, sorry. And I apologize if you hear my dog in the background. If I if I put him in the other room, he'll just bark the whole time. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, so the Reproductive Freedom Act pro protects New Jerseyans by affirming in statute, meaning in a piece of legislation that passes that gets signed by the governor, um, that everyone has the right to reproductive health care, including abortion. Um, the bill itself is about 100 pages, <laughs> um, and you can you can get the bill if you go to the um, the New Jersey State Legislative website. If you've ever done a bill search, you can look it up under Reproductive Freedom Act, um, and it's very long. Uh, but it is very it took a long time not only to decide what we wanted in it, but to make sure that we were saying everything very carefully, um, and we're using. Um, we're very careful in, in the 100 pages to include um, to include all people and all people who can become pregnant, which is not just women. Um, and we use that terminology throughout. Um, and basically says that all New Jerseyans have a fundamental right to access reproductive health care, such as birth control and pregnancy related care, including abortion care, and to make those decisions, their health care decisions without interference from politicians. So it's an actual declaration, um, which, is, um, which is very important. Actually, only across our country, I believe there are only, um, I think there are 13 states, 12, 12 states that have an actual declaration in their um, statutes. But this is very comprehensive. Okay, next slide, please. Another thing, another pillar of importance is that we have something called the Board of Medical Examiners. I don't know if everyone's heard of it. Um, it is a regulatory body in the state of New Jersey. It's not, it's not through the legislature. We don't um, vote for these folks, but it is an administrative body that makes regulations around different healthcare procedures. It's, it's for safety reasons, um, but unfortunately the Board of Medical Examiners has old, old language and has some harmful regulations um, that regulate abortion care different than other healthcare. So for example, um, in, in New Jersey, if you are past um, 14 weeks pregnant, you can't get an abortion anywhere but a hospital setting. Um, that would be an example of a, an, a harmful, unnecessary regulation that the BME um, has on the books. Um, so one of the things we do in the bill is we repeal the many different regulations that the BME has already established. Um, specifically, I will say this is very good news. One thing is very good news that, so Thrive Coalition was doing two things. We were trying to prepare this legislation and introduce it on the one side. On the other side, we were working behind the scenes to try to, and meeting with the, the BME to try to get them to repeal and change their regulations um, administratively. That process is very, very slow. And we were engaged in it for over a year before um, we even started drafting the Reproductive Freedom Act. And so we were doing both, we were kind of addressing it both ways. We're trying to do it administratively as well as legislatively. And the really exciting good news is that on October 13th, um, the Board of Medical Examiners repealed many of these um, regulations that were a big problem in New Jersey. So it's a huge win, we're very excited. So, um, uh, after 14 weeks, you can have office-based um, terminations now. You don't have to be in a hospital. And the other really big regulation that they changed is that it used to be that only doctors, only medical um, MDs could um, actually uh, provide abortion care. And now they've expanded that to nurses, um, physicians, assistants, anybody who's certified in it, even certified midwives. Um, it's actually huge. It is it expands the access of people who can actually perform abortions. It's like 
so exciting. Um, now, because this just happened in our, um, a year after the bill, our bill was introduced and, and our bill repeals a lot of these regulations, um, we haven't really decided, we haven't figured out what we're gonna do yet, if we're gonna take them out of the bill or not. Right now they're still in the bill, just so, so you know, but, um, but it's, it'll kind of be a little bit moot in the bill, but it is a big, it was a big part of our bill. Um, so very happy to say we don't need that part anymore, but technically it's still in the bill. Okay, next slide. So the access piece of the bill is really important. Um, so what this bill, what the RFA does is it ensures um, coverage by mandating that insurance plans cover contraception and abortion. Um, it requires all insurance carriers um, to provide coverage for, for both abortion care and long-term supply of contraceptives. So there are tons of studies that show that if you have to go and get in a prescription and go get your contraception every month, birth control, um, that it, it is more likely that you will have an unplanned pregnant, unplanned pregnancy, because people will not be unable to get it. They, you know, using COVID as an example, um, people couldn't get access. weren't going out. People even couldn't get um, access to their doctors. Um, so what the bill does is it allows a twelve month prescription, um, and will allow someone to have. Um, access to their contraception for 12 months and not have to not need a new prescription, not need to go to the drugstore, not to need to do anything. So um, that's really exciting. And not only does the bill require this, but it also says not only does insurance have to cover it, but there's no out of out of pocket, no deductible, no co-insurance, no co-payment. So none. Um, really trying to eliminate the financial barriers. Um, and New Jersey is one of the states that actually, um, as you saw the court, as I, you saw in the slide with the court case, Medicaid will cover insure, um, will cover abortion care um, for people who have Medicaid. But if you have Medicaid or you have insurance coverage, if you have a private plan, the bill helps you. We wanted to also make sure that we didn't leave anyone behind. And so we really, we added one more feature to this um, to provide access to people who are undocumented. So if you're undocumented, you have no path to getting Medicaid. Um, and so basically it provides, um, it directs the Department of Human Services to um, expand. There is already an existing fund. It's basically to expand it. So it's not really creating it, but um, there is a fund that provides for reproductive health care options, including prenatal care and labor delivery and contraception, but it didn't include abortion care. Um, it includes everything but abortion care um, for folks who are undocumented. And now what this bill does is it adds the abortion care element um, aspect to it. So this access piece of the financial barrier access piece is really um, addressed as, as completely as we really can in the bill. Um, and so again, our goal is not to leave anybody behind. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, so the Reproductive Freedom Act um, doesn't mandate any provider to provide abortion care. Um, it does have religious exemptions. Um, and basically it doesn't change, it doesn't, I, let me back up a second. The reason I included this slide is that there are a lot of, a lot of folks who are afraid of, and I, when I say folks, legislators specifically, <laughs> there are a lot of legislators who are afraid of um, what, what's gonna happen if, if they sign onto this bill. Um, and if there is an, uh, if somebody is against providing abortions, um, if, um, you know, so anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. But so it's basically important to note that 
there are a lot of false narratives out there. Um, and this, this slide is just to, to point out some of those um, uh, um, some of those points. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So the National Institute of Reproductive Health is part of Thrive Coalition. They did, um, they commissioned a poll in March of this year. They polled um, 978 New Jersey registered voters. Um, and we got some really exciting news. Next slide. So New Jersey is very strong in support of abortion rights. Not, not a big surprise. 87% um, believe that decisions about abortion should be made by a pregnant person and their family or with their doctors. And 68% believe abortion should be legal in, in all or most cases. The best part is the next slide. When we polled the Reproductive Freedom Act specifically, we found overwhelming support for it. So, and this 66% is across gender, race, ethnicity, including religion. Um, there were several um, religious backgrounds, including Catholics and Protestants. So there is a lot of public support. Next slide, please. So the status of the Reproductive Freedom Act. The next slide, sorry, Jeff, that's kind of like two, yeah. So this bill, the RFA was introduced in October of last year. We have, we currently have, after a lot of work, 28 assembly sponsors, six Senate sponsors. However, the bill has not moved into committee. So what happens in the legislative process is that once you introduce a bill, it has to be moved into committee. So whatever committee, so for example, the Reproductive Health Act would be, the first committee would likely go into is the health, health committee. So we've been trying and we've been pushing and pushing to get all 70 organizations of us have been pushing to get this into committee since it's been introduced a, um, a year ago with no luck. Um, now, what we have learned, the intel we've learned in the past year um, is that the key leaders in both houses, so in the assembly, it's assembly member Coughlin, and in the Senate, it's um, Senate President Sweeney. Um, they are not moving, have not moved the bill into committee. They're the ones who ultimately decide in the end if a bill gets out of, or sorry, gets moves into committee. So they have basically stalled it, um, mostly out of fear. We've tried to spend the last year educating them about why it's important. Um, especially, I mean, it's, you know, the legal side of it is important, even though we have case law that protects us in New Jersey, we still don't have a statute. And with a really possible fall of Roe versus Wade on the federal level in the Supreme Court, um, there's a lot of fear about what's gonna happen to the right to abortion in New Jersey. Now, if Roe falls, it's not like we're gonna lose the right to abortion tomorrow. We do have pretty good case law in New Jersey to protect us, but there's no reason why we shouldn't have statutory protections as well, and even more expansively. Um, but the leaders in both houses are afraid of using the word abortion, literally. Um, there are some legislators who've read the bill and said, oh, the word abortion is in it too many times. Uh, and there's a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation um, that's being spread around. And there is a movement, the anti, I would call them the antis, but the anti-choice movement, um, the antis are very loud. So as much as 
the 70 organizations plus in Thrive New Jersey Coalition have been making phone calls, getting petitions signed, having meetings with legislators, um, sending postcard campaigns, um, meeting outside of their district offices, getting constituents to write letters, as much as all that's been happening, um, there has been um, no, no movement, really. <laughs> um, and there's been a lot of talk about how it's an election year, as we all know, election day is tomorrow. And we've basically been told as a coalition that the Reproductive Freedom Act is finally going to move during the lame duck session. So lame duck session is the session, the legislative session that starts basically tomorrow. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, Wednesday, the day after election day um, until the end of the year. And it's a time when hundreds of bills pass through the legislature. A lot of bills that the legislators don't want um, to pass before election day because they're concerned about um, uh, they're concerned about any any uh, fallout they may have for it. It happens so fast. These, these bills pass so fast that the public has very little knowledge that any of it's really even happening. Um, it's a very flawed process, but this is when the legislators told us that they will, they will look at the RFA. Um, we have another issue, which is that the two lead sponsors of the bill, uh, Senator Loretta Weinberg, um, she's retiring at the end of this year. She's no, she's not up for real. You know, she didn't want to be reelected. She's retiring. Um, and the assembly member, the lead sponsor, you have to have a lead sponsor in each house. The assembly member, Valerie Huddle, is um, lost her seat. Um, basically, she uh, she's not she's not returning in January, and so. That's kind of a problem because we have two leaders who are not going to be here past the end of December and getting them to prioritize this. I mean, a lot of the legislators don't really care really what they say anymore. <laughs> um, so we, you know, they're great champions, um, but they're not going to be as effective in, in being able to move this among their colleagues. Um, and the last, the last update is that there's been a lot of intelligence going around that they're considering doing a rights only bill. And what that means is they would try to, they would, they would allow the RFA to go into the health committee and the Senate and the assembly and would debate it and ultimately prepare their own bill that takes out all the access pieces of the bill and just have the rights part, the rights only part. Um, and that's really upsetting and just upsetting to the members of the Thrive Coalition because, well, while we certainly want the right to abortion and the right to contraception in our statute, and while that's important for our protections, the big, big piece of this bill is the access. Um, and, Again, if you have rights without access, they are meaningless. And the truth is, is that Roe versus Wade, while it has given a federal right to abortion, um, was weakened the year after that was in that was a Supreme Court case in 1973. It was weakened the year afterward because the Hyde Amendment passed on the federal level, which basically said that no federal dollars could go toward abortion care. And so basically what happened way back when Roe versus Wade started was that it became a protection for people with access. It became a protection for people who could afford it, whether through their own insurance, out of their own pocket. Um, and Roe versus Wade left a lot of people behind. And what we wanna do in New Jersey is we wanna do the right thing and not leave anybody behind and allow and really, really give complete access um, for all people. Um, so 
the next and last slide, Jeff. Um, I want to really spend the rest of the time answering questions and um, you know, sharing with you um, some actions that we're, we're trying to do to help, help this pass in the lame duck. But first, obviously, want to start with questions about the presentation or otherwise. Jeff, how should we do this? Do you want to call on people? or? Sorry, I'm gonna, is that the last slide? I'm going to stop. Yeah. And, OK, great. So I think we have um, a small enough group that people are going to, going to be able to uh, speak directly with you. So why don't we ask folks that have questions to uh, raise the uh, hand feature in uh, Zoom, and uh, we will call on you to unmute. Uh, it looks like Elizabeth has a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Elizabeth. Sorry, I was looking for the mute button. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. So I just had like a question slash comment. I know that, um, you know, elections will kind of like shape what's going to happen. And I had researched the laws of New Jersey a couple months ago, so I don't know that much has changed. But I know that Governor Murphy and his wife, Tammy, that they're like really big supporters of um, of this bill that is coming up. And I know that there was some money that was given because they're in the Trump administration. They have removed the, the federal, like there was some money that was taken away, but then Governor Murphy and Tammy were able to secure additional funds. So I'm just wondering if now, when, if things were to change with the upcoming election, would that mean that this money were to be taken away again or how would that affect the services that are in place now for things like Planned Parenthood? Okay, okay. Um, yes, so I, I think what you're referring to is um, there was about $7 million that um, was removed from the budget. It's family planning money a lot of which went for, to Planned Parenthood, but it was, dead, it was a dedicated line for, for family planning in the New Jersey state budget. And that was removed by um, the previous governor. And it was reinstated as soon as when Governor Murphy took office. I think that might be what you're referring to. Um, that was, I think, I think actually was the very first thing he did when he um, became governor. Um, and yes, he is very supportive of the Reproductive Freedom Act. That's also true. You're right about that. And if, if, the, if the opponent, if uh, candidate um, Cider Jack Citarelli, yeah. Yeah, um, if, he, if he wins tomorrow and if he beats Phil Murphy, um, I don't know what he would do. Uh, with with that, if he would try to undo that, um, he claims that he's pro-choice, the, the Republican uh, challenger. I don't know <laughs> much, much about it, but um, I would hope that the legislature would fight him on it if he were to win and that the legislature wouldn't let it happen. But um, I don't I don't know the answer to that for sure. Is, is that is that answer your question? Yes, I think we just have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the the polls are showing that Murphy is ahead, but you know we don't know until election day, or hopefully we'll find out tomorrow. Sometimes it takes longer than election day, as we've learned. Uh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah. yeah. Um, other questions, and also uh, before I forget. Uh, somebody had had asked in the chat if uh, you would be able to share the slides after the presentation. Uh, is that something you can share oh, with the attendees? I think so. You know, I have to just find out because the Thrive Coalition, I wasn't the sole author of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to just check. Um, but I think probably, or at least most of them. I, can I do that through you, Jeff? Or how would I? Yeah, get just let me know if it's okay to share them. And then okay. uh, I can send the link out to everybody that registered for the event. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of it, I would just double, I just want to double check, but sure. I'm sure no, that makes sense. It's all public, I mean, none of it's really private information. 
Uh, other questions for Noel? Uh, Charles, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. I know. Um, Hi. So, so, so I enjoy the presentation. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I miss uh, uh, something that you had brought up in reference to religious exemption. I think uh, there was an area where there was probably a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. um, when I looked at the bill, it, it appears, and please, this is why I just need clarity. Sure. So they do have an exemption. Or you're saying that that we just have to make sure because uh, make sure that whatever we hear may not be true. But according, what I've read in the bill was that they do have an exemption as long as they give it to them in writing. Yeah. So I, my understanding um, is that you're right that um, the RFA includes religious exemptions for insurance plans as required by federal law. So I think if there is a particular um, I guess if there's an insurance plan that I don't actually know if it's a plan. I believe, I believe that it, I believe that that's true. I don't think, um, they're not, the, the bill doesn't force any provider to provide abortion care. And I don't think, um, it can enforce if someone, if there's a, a religious exemption, um, for an insurance plan, I think they have to abide by it because it's federal law. Um, but I can certainly, Charles, I can get more information on that for you. Um, I know, yeah, I can get more information if that's not, if that's not helpful. Right, because when we advocate for, for this, um, those are questions that may arise. Um, I work with a lot of different organizations and, um, you know, veterans also with uh, religious and that, that's a question that that's definitely going to come up. And then if they cannot get it through, um, through the health provider, through a religious, uh, if they're working in a religious environment, how would they go about if, if this is something that is passing by, how, do, how would they go about to, you know, if they do need to have, uh, get an abortion for whatever uh, reasons they have, how can they go about? How would they go about it? You know, let me, um, let me, let me clarify for you. And um, I can either do it through Jeff or if you want my, my contact directly, um, I can, I can get that information to Jeff. He can get it to you or if, I can give you my email as well. It, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think Jeff, because then it, it's something communal. We'll be able okay. to all see it. So, okay. so yeah, I think that will be uh, the best thing. Sure. Thank you. It's a very good, very good point to raise. Do you want to also just put your email address in the chat so people sure. can email you directly if they need to? Sure. And then while you're doing that, it looks like uh, Razia has uh, a question. Go ahead, Razia. I did have a question for Noel. My question was for those that are watching or watch the, re the recording. Um, is there a way that we can get involved with Thrive New Jersey? Like, do you guys have um, opportunities for people who want to get involved in pushing the message out to do so? Yes and yes. So um, definitely go to the Thrive New Jersey website if you're interested as an, an organization or as an individual of being a member, um, you can read a little bit about, about the coalition and if it's something you're interested in. It's very simple to, to join and be a part of it. Um, and in terms of getting involved, I mean, we have, what's happening now is that we have about two, win, two months, sorry, a two month window to really try and push for the RFA. And we're going to be doing a lot more actions. Um, there's a good chance we're going to be doing a rally in Trenton. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be on a weekday. Uh, so it's going to be harder for people. It has to be on a day that the legislators are actually in session. So we can't do it on a weekend. Um, I know for Stanton Strong, that's an, an issue. A lot of our members uh, work full time or even part time. can't necessarily take the trip down to Trenton, but for, for some of us, um, 
we'll be able to do that and join, join a rally, but there are going to be a lot of other options. So we're going to be making phone calls regularly to the legislators. We're going to be um, sending, doing more postcards. Um, we're going to potentially even be door knocking um, if people are interested in that kind of volunteering in certain districts where we need um, legislators, specifically uh, maybe some of the leaders um, who have the ability to move this bill. Um, we may need to be doing some door knocking and organizing in their districts. Um, if everybody on this call, I don't know where everybody lives. I, I believe it's New Jersey, but I don't know where with, within New Jersey everybody lives. The most important number one thing to do is to contact your state before, you know, before you, you know, kind of involve, get involved in the collective actions. The number one thing is to find out if you don't know already who your state assembly member and state senator are and contact them and let them know that you support the Reproductive Freedom Act and find out if they support it. Um, uh, oh, sorry, and sorry, one more. Um, I just saw a, a, a question thing. But so I what I'd like to do is, and maybe there's a way for me to do this, Jeff, like through, I don't know how to do it through you or like to make it accessible to everybody. Um, but what we have like upcoming actions, like, so say you don't join Thrive per se, and then you're not finding out about these actions through Thrive New Jersey. Um, maybe I could do a parallel way of, you know, doing it through NASW. Like Yeah. So, um, sorry, I'm not muted, right? I'm not. Okay. Um, so uh, NASW uh, New Jersey is a member of the Thrive New Jersey Coalition, and we do support this legislation. Uh, what I am hoping to be able to do with you, Noel, is uh, be able to amplify your calls to action and share information okay. uh, about events and, uh, and ongoing things that Thrive is doing. So um, we can share your advocacy alerts. You know, I, I can forward those to our folks in our network or recreate them through our advocacy alert system uh, so that we can send them out directly. And then we can also share information uh, on social media. And when we share stuff, we can include the, uh, excuse me, the link to the, uh, to the Thrive website so that people can find you that way and, and sign up directly as well. Okay, that's great. That's perfect. So if you don't sign up for Thrive after this call, and then you can get them, we'll share our action alerts with, with NASW, with Jeff. Yeah, that's fantastic. We'll be able to get it that way too. Yeah. Um, I see uh, Matt had a question you put in the chat. Matt, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah. So in your presentation, you mentioned some of the um, regulations that the Board of Medical Examiners and Insurance Companies have created mm -hmm. that block um, abortion care. Mm -hmm. uh, like the most common examples that you've heard of and how does the RFA uh, address those issues or, or plan to solve them? So on, on the insurance side, um, it's mostly just that they don't cover abortion care. Um, I mean, some do and some don't. Um, and uh, I, I think that's pretty straightforward. For, for the BME, um, the BME was really treating abortion care different from other healthcare procedures, like kind of like broad, broad stroke. Um, abortion, especially in, in the first trimester, which is honestly, where like almost 90% of abortions happen in the first trimester, or maybe it's 92%, um, is such a safe and easy procedure um, that the fact that they were making all these restrictions, such as, you know, like one of the restrictions is that if you were past a certain um, gestational age like in your pregnancy, so if you were past like 19, 19 weeks, like your medical provider who was going to provide the abortion had to have certain admitting uh, rights at a, at a local hospital. Um, even though there's really no reason, like this is a very easy in office procedure, but um, part of this rule is to make it harder for, for medical providers to actually provide abortions. Um, and so as, as 
time would go on. So past 19 weeks, you'd have to apply. You'd have to like apply to the BME and say, this is my medical provider. And does he or she have the credentials that are okay? <laughs> um, and, and what happens is that that really creates, first of all, it creates a lot of work for everybody unnecessarily. Um, and it also creates a lot of delay. Um, and that's a really, that's a small, a small regulation. Um, but even though, I mean, there's no reason to have to have access to a hospital, um, at, you know, at, at that kind, for that kind of a procedure. But, um, but that was kind of one of an example of one of the things they would do. I don't know if anyone's heard of the trap. Has anyone heard of trap laws? It's, it's, it's an acronym, it's T-R-A-P, and it stands for Targeted Regulations for Abortion Providers, T-R-A-P. And what's been happening across the country, I mean, literally ever since Roe versus Wade was, was passed, there've been over, over, well over a thousand, probably closer to 1,200 laws that have passed in our country um, restricting abortion. So it's been a very, and most of those laws are on the state level. Um, so it's been a very slow, but very steady um, uh, path basically to restrict access to abortion care. What really has happened is that the anti-choice movement um, has really worked very, very diligently and very hard since 1973 <laughs> to restrict the right to abortion and restrict who can have the right to abortion. So when the Hyde Amendment was passed, really it was like, you know what, we lost, we lost the battle. We lost, you know, Roe versus Wade. We lost that battle, but we're going to now make sure that poor women don't have access. Like we'll do whatever we can to make sure that we can keep restricting access. And these, what these trap laws are doing across the country are just making it harder and harder for abortion providers to actually just provide a very basic, safe, common medical procedure. Um, I mean, it is childhood and, um, I'm sorry, pregnancy and labor um, is more dangerous than uh, abortion, you know, abortion care, especially in the early, in the early stages. So um, there are other regulations at the BMA. Um, has created, but luckily, and not luckily, after some work, now that we're in a good place that the BME is not, um, they've repealed most of them. And that's really exciting. Um, uh, but so the, the RFA tried to address them also just takes um, old like laws off the books. Like there are some old like statutes um, before our case laws were decided. Um, and it kind of just removes old language and cleans it up. A lot of the law, a lot of the statutes do that, but is that is that helpful, Matthew? Is that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, we still have a little bit more time. If there's another question or two, um, while we're waiting to see if any other hands are are raised or any other questions come in the chat, I just had a couple of like practical procedural questions about the path of the legislation. Uh, okay. you mentioned I you had mentioned I think that there were six Senate sponsors and 28 assembly sponsors currently correct uh, is there any bipartisan support for the bill or is it all one party that's not, not currently not currently um, so it's, it's all Democrats I presume yes, that are yes, yes. that are supporting the bill and um, did the bill have additional primary sponsors besides the leads uh, huddle and Weinberg that might be willing to take on the primary role for the bill? Um, we have some what we call allies, um, you know, kind of champions. And um, there are a handful of assembly members who are really likely to be our allies. And we're in conversation with them right now, like literally right now, um, to see if they can kind of help take the lead and also um, work with their colleagues to try and bring some of their colleagues along. Mm -hmm. One of our concerns is that because the leaders of both houses, so Coughlin in the Assembly and Sweeney in the Senate, have been somewhat clear to their members that they're not, at least initially when it was introduced, that they were not willing to move the bill. 
a lot of us, a lot of the legislators felt like they had cover. So they felt like, you know what, I can go be a co-sponsor because my leader is not going to pass this bill. So I can look like I am pro reproductive health care and I'm pro abortion care and I'm pro all these, you know, you know, important health care rights. Um, but I'm never going to have to really be held accountable and have to vote for it because my leader says it's not going to go into committee and go to the floor for a vote. Um, so we're having, we're kind of backtracking right now with all of our co-sponsors because we have a lot um, and really trying to ascertain if they are actual allies and actual sponsors because you know, we, if we think we have X number of votes and then we find out we don't because they thought it was never going to go forward, that's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, that that uh, definitely makes sense. And I can see how that would be a problem. It, it didn't even occur to me that people might just be signing on because they didn't think the bill would ever move. Yeah, it's amazing what happens in the legislature. <laughs> so so in, in that uh, line of thought, then, in speaking to uh, allies, um, I, I guess you you would also be lining up people who would reintroduce it in the next session in the event that there is no sufficient movement that the bill doesn't pass or or get vetoed or whatever that the, the process just is left hanging at the end of this session. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, we, we haven't lined them up yet, but we have an idea of who, who would be willing to run with it. Our, our biggest emphasis right now is trying to get it get it passed before the end of the calendar year. So we haven't focused that much on that. Um, we would have to, you know, we would re have to rewrite the bill without some of the BME, without the board medical examiner's regulations and things like that anyway. Um, our biggest concern is that they're gonna try to push through a rights only bill to just put um, abortion uh, and contraception access, I mean, um, protections, but no access um, pieces to the bill. And that, that's our biggest concern right now. When you um, say they, do you mean the legislature? Sorry, I do. I mean the legislators. I'm concerned that they're going to try and uh, come up with, which is what happens a lot during lame duck session. When things are happening at kind of breakneck speed, um, you know, bills can kind of like pop up and <laughs> legislators have no idea, like, you know, have barely had a chance to read it. Um, and, you know, when, you know, when you've got this deadline of, you know, that's right on you. It, it kind of creates a lot of, um, there, there's darkness in it, right? And, and there, it's, it's a cloud, a cloud over the process and it, it makes it less transparent and less clear. Um, and we really don't want, look, what will Phil Murphy do if, you know, the legislature comes up with, instead of the RFA, they come up with just a rights only bill that doesn't deal with any access and they put in front of Governor Murphy, you know, what does he do? right? The advocates are not going to get another bite at this apple. I mean, we can say, you know, the reason we put all the access pieces into it was because we knew that the rights component was the one that more people would have, you know, would, it would be easier for them to, to support. Um, and if, if we have to have a bill next session, that's just these access pieces and not the rights piece, um, th that's never going to see the light of day. Thank you. Uh, I did have one other question, and of course, it, it flew right out of my head, just to uh, follow up on what you were saying, and you know, something popped up on my screen that distracted me, and now I can't remember what it was I was going to ask. Um, oh, it's the the, uh, the rights bill only. Um, has anything like that been introduced yet? No. We just, okay, so it's just something that could- No, it, it's, it's, it's just our concern. We've had, you know- Got it. It could be percolating there. It's a way for the legislators to say, look, we did something but it's kind of hollow. Um, Cause again, we do have our, our court cases and our, our case law precedents pretty strong. If Roe versus Wade um, gets gutted or, you know, depending on what happens in, on the December 1st case, um, we still have the right to abortion. It's just the problem here in New Jersey is not everybody can access it. And again, if you don't have the access piece to this bill, it's meaningless. We can't, only some of us have a right to, you know, abortion care and contraception. It's not okay. We all have to have that. Well, Nicole, uh, Noel, thank you so much uh, for the presentation and for all the information. Uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, but again, uh, 
thank you for this. And you'll be seeing additional updates uh, from the Thrive New Jersey Coalition, as well as from NASW New Jersey uh, on the process with this bill and how you can get engaged. Uh, I assume that probably very short some uh, advocacy alerts yes. coming out from very Thrive. Very shortly. <laughs> yeah, asking people not just to uh, their legislators, but also maybe to reach out to the uh, the heads of the committees uh, and to the legislative leaders uh, to encourage them to bring this bill for a hearing. Yeah, it'll be both. Actually, yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you, everybody. We really yeah. need. We, we're going to need help. So I hope you either sign on to Thrive New Jersey or just look out for the action alerts through NASW. Great. Really thank you so it. much, Noel, and and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you at our next community conversation. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.